Hello and welcome to the Automotive Anecdotes podcast, the podcast that's normally for all that useless information your friends would rather you not talk about, but these episodes are a little bit different. We are joined by some very special guest panellists to talk about the future of motoring and more specifically the future of what's going to fuel it. Uh, I am the layman here, my name is Martin Clayton uh, on Twitter as at Bob Clayton 92 Hi, uh, I'm John. Uh, so your usual host for the other Automotive Tales podcasts and at John MSM on all social media outlets. Hi, everybody. My name's Graham Bennett. I've been brought in to the, join the discussion uh, to present the views on hydrogen. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Shanahan. I'm an automotive journalist and EV owner. I am at Jet L Bomb on Twitter. So we start in a place that uh, most people will probably be uh, aware of. Uh, now, You've probably seen throughout the news uh, and uh, in your local dealership, uh, electric vehicles or battery electric vehicles are becoming more commonplace. Manufacturers are finding this uh, a, a nice, easy way to get under the EU emissions targets alongside hybrid. But of course, we also then have radical new companies such as Tesla that have brought their vehicles onto the market and made others uh, think a little bit more. Uh, hurriedly. Uh, to get us around this one, we have uh, Jess Shanahan, of course, joining us to talk about uh, electric vehicles and a recent electric vehicle owner. And actually, I think that's probably a good place to start, Jess. You are now uh, a newly converted uh, electric vehicle owner, but my understanding is that that didn't actually just happen overnight. No, I I had the the privilege of doing a, a big kind of press stunt road trip back in 2016, uh, and we did it all in an electric car. So it was two and a half thousand miles around the UK and Ireland, and from that point I was hooked. Um, and I've been writing about you know kind of electric cars, future of mobility, charging infrastructure, all of that kind of thing ever since. And um, just you know as as my you know daily driver was getting a bit long in the tooth, I thought right now's the time to get an electric car in terms of kind of like the mileage and everything it, ju it just made sense plus I thought it was about time I put my uh, my money where my mouth is <laughs> so for for, for the, the real layman in the room or listening to the podcast not meaning to cast aspersions to your listeners John um, but could you give <laughs> us a, a brief uh, overview of essentially how do electric vehicles work on a real sort of top level uh, well, there's obviously no uh, petrol engine for a start yes yeah so it's all um, powered by a simple motor um, and you know uh, run by electricity so um, the, the, the best way I can kind of uh, explain it it's kind of like uh, your mobile phone so if you if you do have off street parking and a home charger you drive your car around during the day um, the Renault Zoe EV I have does about 240 miles to a full charge uh, under ideal driving conditions um, but all I do is you know I get home at the, at the end of the day after doing my driving plug it in as I would my mobile phone and the next day it's fully charged um, there's there's no kind of gearbox or revs to climb through which means the best part or at least in my opinion as someone who loves cars and driving is that you get this instant torque there's no kind of waiting for the engine to kind of reach its peak you just put your foot down and you go which is is delightful and uh, in terms of the Renault Zoe then what was it that made you go for go down the Renault route when you were looking at getting one yourself um, so I, I really like kind of just compact, simple, straightforward cars. And um, I find that a lot of the, the larger SUV, SUV style kind of EVs out there um, are just a bit dull. Um, so I wanted something with a bit of character and I felt the Zoe had, had a bit more of that. But um, the range really appealed to me. So, um, you know, a lot of electric cars are still hovering around the 200 mark, but the Zoe just kind of went that little bit further, but they also had um, a GT line. So it's slightly sportier in, in looks and in that, you know, that initial power when you put your foot down. Um, and I was able to get it in purple. So <laughs> there's that as well. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Even better. Um, you mentioned that so there were, there were two words that you've already said uh, that, that I, I think we will come back to at some point in the podcast I'm sure people will pick it up but um, you, you mentioned range and you've mentioned ideal driving conditions mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to tie that into in 2016 you did this um, drive the two and a half thousand mile drive uh, have you noticed an, an, a sort of improvement in the technology from what you were driving then to what you're, you've now picked up and is on your driveway? Yeah, absolutely. So we did it in a, a Kia Soul EV, um, and the again the 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 quoted range was about 
120, 130 miles, but we were getting more like 100 miles um, or eight, maybe 80 if we're doing kind of like motorway driving. Um, so the, the, the battery technology is, is, you know, hugely improved and, you know, the, the power off the line, um, I can really tell the difference, but even just the charging infrastructure, now that I'm kind of going out and about and charging again, it, it wasn't difficult in 2016 to find a charger, but now there's so much more choice um, and there's a lot of more powerful chargers out there as well. Mm. And I know that this week we've just, uh, or a couple of weeks ago uh, in uh, Essex, we had our first uh, EV only, uh, and I still want to call it petrol station, but that's just not right, is it? But uh, charging station has uh, opened to the masses. I don't have you. I take it what with the restrictions, you've probably not visited it yet. But uh... no, not yet. But um, I, you know, I've, there's a few of my EV friends, and we keep talking about right. That's going to be our meetup spot, but um, it will eventually be one of 100 across the UK. So I think that's quite exciting for for EV owners, especially if they don't have you know, the ability to charge at home, to have like a ded dedicated place to go to as you would a petrol station uh, makes things a lot easier for people. Yeah, and I was really pleased to see that uh, in this new, I uh, saw some pictures of the inside of this charging station. I was really pleased to see that even in an electric charging station, you still have to have a WH Smith and still pay three pounds for a bottle of water. So <laughs> I'm glad that you have the same misery as all of uh, the ICE drivers for now. So that's uh, reassuring to hear that you're not getting special privileges at the moment. Uh, that might change. Maybe you'll get a discount. Um, does anyone, any of the other panelists want to um, uh, ask anything there? Because I appreciate it. I've been asking the questions as the layman there, but... Uh, so go on, I, there's something I'd never really thought about before that kind of came up in that discussion. Obviously, you, you talk about going to this new, I still want to call it a petrol station as well, this new petrol station, uh, this new garage, there we go, that's a better word for it, um, with friends to kind of meet up and you'll all go and charge and you can, you can almost socialise. And I never really thought that actually there's potentially a, a social element, a social benefit, which given the restricted times we're sitting in at the moment with, uh, I know certainly, Graham, you're in tier four, we're still in tier three up here. Jess, I'm not quite sure where, where you sit between the tiers, but the idea of any sort of social gathering actually is quite a positive thought. And I always kind of assumed, well, going and charging is just a, it's a faff. If you're on a long journey, you want to, you want to stop, fill up, go. But actually there might be, there might be this whole new dynamic that comes to motoring, which is the socializing element of when you all stop to recharge with electric vehicles, which will inevitably always take an amount of time and it's always going to be, I guess, longer than putting petrol or diesel into a normal uh, internal combustion engine car. Um, and I wonder whether that's actually going to change the face of motoring a little bit as well, and whether it will make it more of a sociable activity when you get to service stations. So for, from my experience, I've really found that, you know, if you're if you're stopping and charging someone, I had this on the, the big Route 57 road trip I did, because lots of people were following our, like, our, the route that we were taking around the UK and Ireland. Um, every so often we'd stop and charge and there'd be someone there waiting for us just to kind of chat about what was going on. <laughs> they just plugged in their car and, and we're thinking, how did you know that we were going to be here? Because we weren't specifically saying which charges we would stop at. And I think at one before we got on the ferry to go to Ireland, there was a gentleman there uh, and he was like, well, this is the only charger between this place and this place. So I assumed you'd stop here. So he just waited there for us and um, <laughs> he helped us out with a tricky charger where one of our um one of our apps or our cards didn't work so he basically just paid for our charge um which was really nice of him but we just had you know a little bit of socialization for 20 minutes while we topped up the car before we went to go go on over to to Ireland and I, I think a lot of EV drivers have really embraced the the concept of kind of like this slower pace of travel um mm. and there is kind of you know a social element as part of that because you you have something more in common with the people that you see when you charge than maybe you do as um, an ICE car owner just going up to a petrol station. Um, so, you know, it's not a new thing to have car meetups, but I think, you know, this, this slower pace of EV travel, at least at the moment, um, is really going to kind of facilitate that, especially with, you know, um, charging stations like this new one in Braintree. Yeah, so never mind caffeine and machine, it'll be, I don't know, chocolate and charge. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's really interesting. Uh, something else you touched on there was uh, the time it takes to, to recharge. So I'd quite like to kind of dip into that a little bit because 
I think it, it obviously varies from from vehicle to vehicle, and and it is changing quite rapidly. So, you did your your road trip in twenty sixteen, um, and obviously you've now got a, a brand new twenty twenty EV. Um, do you have you find the actual charging rate has changed quite a lot? I know Tesla are way ahead of everybody else, it seems, with their superchargers. But is everybody else catching up? And is it actually a long time to get a decent charge, or can it be done quite quickly now? So uh, a lot of the time when we were charging on the road trip, we were doing we were charging at uh, either slow, uh, meaning like we were basically plugging into a three pin at a hotel, um, mm-hmm. or we were doing uh, rapid charges. But there's like fast that's in the middle of that. But now the infrastructure has come on in such a way that it's so easy to find a rapid charger, and they're usually fifty kilowatts. Um, the difference really is the. Um, the the battery sizes and the battery capacities in the electric cars are larger so actually charging times have increased slightly um okay but there is a so for example i have a 50 kilowatt hour battery in my zoe uh if we go to a rapid charger uh that's you know a 50 kilowatt charger um that rapid charges to 80 percent, so it's just under an hour to get an 80 percent charge and then trickle charges to um to 100 percent um There are also fast chargers and all sorts of things which take a bit longer, but there's a a big rollout of like super rapid chargers. So obviously Tesla, like you say, with superchargers, I think they're up to something silly like 350 kilowatts or something like that. But there is a um, there is a rollout of um, these extra fast chargers happening and you can occasionally find one that's like 100 kilowatts or 150 kilowatts, um, but not every car supports them yet. So it, it really kind of depends. But I think something that we're going to see now with this extra pressure from, you know, this, this deadline that's been brought forward are these, you know, increasingly powerful chargers that are going to help everyone charge more quickly, along with obviously the, the, the technology in the cars having to keep up with that as well. So um, although it might take me, you know, 45 minutes to get 80% from, from zero, and I'm rarely at zero. <laughs> I've never been at zero, in fact. Um, Although it takes that time at the moment, I think we'll rapidly start to see that come down as, you know, over this next decade or so. It's an interesting question, Jess, and and I know you made the analogy about mobile phones. And I know for me, just sitting here looking at my desk drawer, I've probably got a a library of previous connections that used to to work my iPhone 6, but now don't work my iPhone 10. Mm. Is that, how do you see that? Uh, evolving because I know that there have been um, changes from from AC to DC charging. You mentioned mm-hmm. the change, you know, the, from a three pin plug to a um, to a rapid DC charger. How do we how do we make sure that the manufacturers don't build in this sort of technology obsolescence that makes your early generation battery incapable of plugging into a rapid charger? Yeah, I mean, I would love to see some standardization and, and we don't have that at the moment. You know, um, there even now, like some home chargers that were, you know, originally this this type one, which was like the uh, the early style. Most cars are now type two. So you can't plug into your your home if you had a previous charger. Mm-hmm. It, there's adapters and things to make it easier. But, you know, for the for the most part, I think what we need is some standardization because kind of every although there, there is kind of some, some commonality between manufacturers, there's still the difference between, you know, for example, if you go to a rapid charger, uh, you usually have two different types of connectors. You have Chademo um, and then you have CCS, which are just, just two different types of connectors, but they have both because there are cars out there that have one or the other. Um, so, you know, at the moment it's been fine because we're not far enough really into like the, the life cycle and the development and evolution of, of battery electric vehicles for there to be an be a problem there but i think it is something that manufacturers are going to have to start talking to one another about because otherwise you know you you could buy a second-hand vehicle not really think about it as someone who's brand new to electric cars um and just think right i can go charge wherever i want and then realize that you either don't have the dc charging capability because actually the renault zoe's are sold without that for people who do only charge at home um i chose the dc charging option because i'm out and about quite a lot Um, so, you know, there is, uh, you know, there's an education element there as well, but I also think some kind of standardization would, would really help. Thanks. It's, it's an interesting point that, because just before Graham asked that, I was, I was thinking in my head, you know, cars like the Nissan Leaf, for example, that have been out for now nearly 10 years, um, 
And I just thought, oh, I'll have a quick look and just see sort of what they're going for on Auto Trader now, sort of a Mark One <laughs> Leaf. And and obviously they'll only do eighty miles on a charge. You know, they the 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 sort of they were the real primitive technology, but they're now down to five grand for a for a leaf with a battery. But does that mean that if if the technology keeps changing and the adapters keep changing, does that mean we're going to be left with um, you know potentially sort of thousands of early model cars that just eventually are still usable? but have to be scrapped or is is that is i don't know if that's something that's going to ha- could happen or could they be retrofitted or it just feels like a, a potential waste of uh, well metal and batteries but i don't know whether that's been cons- i don't know is that a thing <laughs> well I, as as far as i'm aware because the manufacturers are so kind of focused on you know recycling and you know being green and environmentally friendly I don't necessarily think there will be an obsolescence with older vehicles but I think it will be more difficult for for people to find the right charger so there will always be somewhere to charge it's just you've got to find the one that's right for your car and thankfully there are like mapping apps and things that let you filter by the type of charger so you're not going to look on your map and go, oh, there's a charge there and you rock up and it's a Tesla supercharger that, you know, doesn't work for anything but a Tesla, for example. Um, but, you know, I think I think a lot of the time people will be charging at home. So they'll install the correct charger for the car that they buy um, and their adapters and things. Um, but it's just a case of the 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 person buying the car needs to have access to the right information just to know what they're getting themselves into. And I think actually a lot of used car dealerships, unless they're specialists in, you know, battery electric vehicles, uh, they don't know how to guide people. Um, So, you know, if if someone part exchanges a leaf for, you know, something else on the lot, then um, that, that dealer might not know how to, how to guide the next customer that comes along and wants to buy it. And I think that is an issue um, that, that is going to need to be addressed going forward. I'm just coming back to, to Martin's point because I think it's a fascinating question. Mm. In in the future, Jess, how do you how do you test your battery? So if you're looking at a 10-year-old leaf, mm. for example, I mean today we'd all have a good listen to an internal combustion engine. We'd be listening for cams and big ends and water mm. pump bearings and pulleys and things. How do you do that in the future? How do you determine the condition of a battery and decide whether it's got another 50,000 miles of life in it or not? So um, I would actually say it's probably more simple than, you know, listening to an engine or, you know, um, uh, you know, an ICE engine, because uh, a lot of um, battery electric vehicles connect to an app of some kind that will show you battery condition. Um, Or it's like a simple diagnostic plug in at a dealership to to work it out. Um, I know that a lot of the, the more kind of modern um, battery electric vehicles have a battery swap um, at, at you know like three or five years or something like that obviously depends on the manufacturer um, but you know I think just being able to connect to your car and always know you know even as the owner so I could I could look you know right now and look at the condition of my my Zoe's battery and you know is it is it still running at kind of full power are there issues in a in a certain cell um, you know does it need maintenance or anything like that okay Good, thank you. I think it's, there's a really interesting point to, to kind of to make for people that might not be aware. Obviously, you buy a, a petrol diesel car, you've got a, a regular servicing interval, so it's you know 12 months or X thousand miles, and your car goes in for service items like oil change, spark plugs. Obviously, if it's a petrol, not a diesel, uh, you know, filters, all these bits associated with an internal combustion engine. Well, actually, with an electric vehicle, all of that's out the window. You actually, I, I, I presume there's some sort of coolant for the, the battery and the motor system that probably needs changing every couple of years, but there isn't that requirement for a, an annual service. So actually, in, in terms of um, the degradation of the vehicle, which is kind of what we're talking about here, it's really focused entirely on the battery. The rest of the vehicle is much of a muchness, uh, except for your usual service items you see maybe at you know, seven, eight years old, where you've got bushes or brakes, things like that need looking at, uh, and your regular consumables like tyres, there's actually very little to do with an electric car, I presume. Its, it's service interval is just checking the battery's okay. Yeah, there, there are so few moving parts in, a, in an electric vehicle that the, the actual servicing is quite simple. And I think, you know, for a lot of dealerships will recommend servicing every year just to check brakes, tyres, filters, all of that kind of thing. Um, 
but realistically yeah you're right it, it's mostly down to to the battery and um just checking that that everything is okay there and it's going to be running smoothly but that um is you know a, a big kind of win for for battery electric vehicles is that servicing costs because the actual service is so much more simple servicing costs are actually a fair bit lower and re really stupid question here but presumably they still need to have an mot when they get to three years old okay yeah. It just suddenly occurred to me when John was saying um, th those things there that uh, if, 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 if you don't have to have your vehicle serviced, uh, I suppose one of the potential problems would be as they become more mainstream, um, then there probably needs to be that regular servicing for things like the tyres. Otherwise, we're going to have people driving around with bald tyres until they're three years old, uh, going in for an MOT and going, um, yeah, those are some nice cords. It's, um, yeah, <laughs> interesting one that if there's no warning noises or warning lights because nothing's actually gone wrong um then it almost becomes more important to check the servicing schedule because mm. it's all those things outside of the engine that yeah could mm. potentially go wrong but it, it kind of brings me on to another thought um that kind of came to mind as, as you were talking then jess is when it comes to actually doing maintenance or repairs or as you pointed out a battery swap i guess one of the things that we we're going to see a change in is you know your fred in his shed down the road who would could do you an oil change and a filter change or you know do your brakes for you probably won't be capable of servicing electric vehicle i guess it's relatively specialist equipment because you're dealing with what well, they're like tens of thousands of volts the the battery packs on them um so i guess with your car that you've got and i don't know whether you've any other experience but i presume it has to go back to the dealer because there aren't any independents or certainly that are not that i've seen yet for those yeah, I think there are a few independents out there now. They're starting to pop up and, you know, actually, if you can go and get some kind of electric vehicle qualification and, and set up as an independent, now is absolutely the time to do it. Um, but, yeah, it, it has to go back to the dealership. And, you know, even things like brakes, which a lot of people might do themselves if they've, you know, got the space and the knowledge. Um, because the, the car has regenerative braking, meaning that it'll try and, you know, get back some charge from the, the energy of braking. Um, even even the braking system slightly trickier um, and then obviously you've got to think about you know the, the safety of working with something that's you know um, could potentially electrocute you uh, all that um, kind of that power and all that, those metal parts there is a, a big kind of safety concern and you know that which is actually um, a bit big barrier to electric cars in motorsport as well beyond those top level series um, so yeah, it, it's not, you know, electric cars aren't for the enthusiasts necessarily who want to mod their cars and, you know, do all that fun stuff. But, you know, the, those, you know, old classics and future classics that you would do that to, I don't think are going to go anywhere anyway. Uh, thinking about um, uh, the, the sort of other sectors that might use um, electric vehicles, uh, from, from, from the outside looking in, I must admit, I found it surprising that um, the whole London taxi network was able to adapt perhaps quicker than a lot of small uh, sort of van couriers within cities and things like that as well. I know they are slowly getting there and there are a lot of electric vans and and obviously, you know, the London uh, uh, the London cabs have also brought along the electric LDVs as well, which means we've now got an electric Chinese van on the market as well. But do you envisage that that's a sector that will grow perhaps even quicker than the, the, the retail sector in terms of sales? Yeah, so I, I think that there's already uh, growth is already being shown kind of in like the commercial vehicle sector. Um, I, I found that, you know, in talking to people, one of the biggest barriers is uh, payload of, of electric vans. Um, they can't carry uh, at the moment. They can't carry as much as, you know, an ICE uh, vehicle. Um so, you know, any anyone that's doing kind of like deliveries for, you know, whether it's um, Amazon or something like that, then an electric van actually makes a lot of sense. But when it's like higher payload things like you know, maybe builders or something like that, it becomes a bit trickier. Um, but actually, if you can find the right van and there are ones out there that, that will carry, you know, a ton of stuff. Um, then actually, again, the technology is moving so quickly that give it a couple of years time and, and the electric kind of vans and, you know, even the bigger trucks will become way, way, way more viable. And we, we know Tesla has already threatened to bring electric uh, HGVs uh, at some point to, um, uh, I'm sure, well, and pickup trucks, although I, the idea of the Cybertruck actually making it through an NCAP test would be quite fun to watch. 
Um, but we shall see. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how that's going to do with passenger, sorry, not passenger, uh, pedestrian safety being effectively a knife edge <laughs> on the front. That uh, strikes me as interesting. Another Ford F-150 is as pedestrian friendly. Really. A brick I mean, wall with a Ford badge on it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, at least with the uh, the Cybertruck, the injury rate will be low because the death rate was a hundred percent. So you know, you got to you got to weigh it up. It's uh, <laughs> no, the, just, anyway. Um, um, I suppose this is a really good point then to um, sort of uh, wrap up the, uh, the, the the sort of electric um, debate. So I think if perhaps if we just finish off by doing sort of a, a, a round robin of, of sort of any points that we feel we um, may have missed before we uh, regroup for our next episode where we look at uh, perhaps some uh, lesser lesser known um, uh, alternatives. Because I think it's fair to say that electric uh, beyond hybrid is probably the sort of main three, petrol, electric and hybrid are the main three. Uh, and we'll obviously get to go and explore some uh, other options that people may not be as aware of. Um, so if, if we go around the go around the, 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 the virtual room and just any, any other points you want to add, but John, if I start with you, uh, is you in my top left corner? Very good. Uh, yes, I mean, I think it's been a really interesting discussion. There's there's loads of other considerations that I think we need to start considering as, as a country. But I know there was a 10 point plan that followed on very shortly after the um, the legislation for the 2030 ban on internal combustion engines uh, that I think starts to lay out how we're going to address that. Um, you know, putting lots of electric vehicles onto the grid. Um, and there, there is a concern, I think, for me there, but um, maybe that's for a, another podcast. Um, but yeah, I think the thing that's kind of come out of this discussion, we started to, to eke out what are the benefits, what are the limitations to things like your charging network, things like your, your distance you can travel, maintenance, etc. And I think it will lead nicely into the future sections where we're going to talk about other technologies and how those might knit together because I, I personally think it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all for the future. Uh, I think there's going to be uh, to kind of as horses for courses. Um, certain people will find the electric vehicle suits them, but I don't think it will suit all the applications we currently use petrol and diesel for. So I think this is a good groundwork for the, the rest of the discussion. Real. Uh, Graham, anything you wanted to uh, add? Uh, no, just to thank Jess for uh, answering some questions. And then thank you, Graham. My level of knowledge and understanding of... Uh, of EVs all sounds very exciting, sounds very positive for the future, and, and clearly part of the solution. Bro, and Jess, uh, obviously in your early days as an EV owner, but uh, what do you think that in terms of the EV future um, for yourself and and obviously more more generally, a positive uh, sort of outlook for the future for EV? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there who an EV would actually suit now. Um, who don't do very many miles, maybe they just drive 10 or 20 miles a day to work and they would be exactly the kind of person that would treat their car like a phone, plug it in overnight, drive it again the next day and then repeat with the occasional like slightly longer trip. I do still think there are um, some challenges and some limitations in terms of infrastructure, um, you know, the, the strain on the grid, um, all of that kind of thing. But there's actually lots of technology kind of coming out to address all of those challenges. It's just whether we can let those two things kind of meet up before this, this deadline. Well, thank you very much for your time on those discussions there. Uh, hopefully it's been enlightening for you listening uh, as well. But it just leaves me to say, uh, Jess, a big thank you uh, for your uh, input on this one. Thank you very much. It's been great to be here. And Graham, thank you as well for joining us and taking time out your schedule. Uh, thanks, Martin. I enjoyed taking part in the, in the discussions. Brilliant. And John, uh, I'm sure we will be back. Uh, but uh, thank, you, thank you for co-hosting with me or taking your specialist role uh, in this week's episode. Uh, and we will see you all very soon to continue the discussion. Excellent. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching.